so thanks, everyone. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, you having us, in, and it's a pleasure to help help sponsor this. This what has been a great event so far. So thanks for that. Um, you know, I have the challenge of coming between a 40-minute break and lunch, so I'm not sure if that's the prime spot or the worst spot. I was debating that right now. Um, I also have the challenge of following some great speakers before me, and uh, I assume most of you heard from my colleague Val Bercovici yesterday. Yeah, so uh, you can think of me as Val's uh, less intelligent, less attractive cousin at NetApp. <laughs> Just come along, sweep up in his wake, you know. Um, he has a slightly higher hoodie quotient than I do as well, so. Um, so that, uh, what we're gonna talk about today for the next 40, 45 minutes um, is really this concept of data fabric. Really, how can we instantiate some of the stuff Val talked about yesterday, some of the stuff other speakers are talking about, and start to bring it home um, in terms of things that you can bring um, back to your business and back to your customers uh, you know, tomorrow. As we go through this, I wanna talk about where NetApp's vision is going. Data fabric for us, this concept of data fabric is not a product. Right? It's not a sales pitch, as you, as you might think of it conventionally, and it's not even a NetApp thing. Right? That sounds weird. We're the ones going around talking about data fabric. But our conception is this is the glue. Right? This is the fabric, literally, that's going to tie hybrid cloud together. Right? And part of that, we hope, comes from NetApp, obviously, but part of that is going to be part of a huge ecosystem, including our partners and our customers, and heck, even some of our competitors. And that's okay. Right? Everyone knows this isn't going to be going into the future a homogenous homogenous environment, right? It's gonna be best of breed wherever it takes, whether it's on-prem and cloud service providers are out in these hyperscalers. So uh, I am on, on Twitter at, uh, I think we need to work on our slide template. It gets too dark on the bottom, but at backs on tap is my Twitter handle, so please uh, feel free to, to shoot um, insults my direction. Um, I already had one person who volunteered to be a heckler during the session, so I may take her up on it if it gets too boring. So. We're all here talking about the same sort of set of challenges, right? And especially when it comes to data fabric and when it comes to cloud, right? This concept of how do I maintain responsiveness or how do I improve responsiveness? How do I find innovative ways to deal with the challenges of all of these new applications, of all of these new modalities of delivering service to customers and to end users, right? How do I maintain control, right? So one of the biggest things that I don't think gets missed and it doesn't get lost on this audience, but sometimes gets lost in the in the rush to the cloud is just because you're moving to the cloud doesn't give you a get out of jail free card. In fact, it's sometimes the exact opposite, a get into jail card, right? Um, as we've seen with hack after hack, we've now found a pretty efficient way that you can be a remarkably good CIO or CEO and have one incident end your career at a company, right? There's, there's actually very few paths that that can happen overnight, but we've seen it now with things like Target and other places where, where hacks and just loss of data. And in some cases, they're from clouds or outsourced data services or things not even under your direct control, but it doesn't mean you have abrogated the responsibility to have stewardship of that data. So we all know that, right? We all have that inherent. And then finally, the concept of choice, right? Choosing the resources that work best for your business. Um, one of the speakers that I absolutely love inside NetApp is our CIO, uh, a woman named Cynthia Stoddard. If you ever get a chance to see her speak, um, absolutely outstanding because she's not just talking about Here's what we're doing inside of NetApp, but here's how we're trying to be a thought leader with our own IT. Um, Cynthia has the challenge of being customer number zero at NetApp, right? So she's literally, when we talk about eating your own dog food, right? Like this is like the pre, we haven't even turned it into dog food yet, but please run our production on it, right? So that, that's a challenge any CIO would love. And the interesting thing is you ask her and you say, so all your data is on NetApp, right? You're a storage company? You're gonna put all your data on NetApp? That's not true. Right? Today, her role has changed into a role of choice. Right? It's changed into being a broker of services. It's changed into every time a service comes to her, it's can I run this as software as a service? Right? If I can't do that, can I find a platform as a service? If I can't do that, can I find infrastructure as a service? Right? And if I can't do that, can I find a service provider who can host it for me and build it for me so I can get out of the business of building data centers? And only, and if only then, every single one of those gates is tripped and we haven't found a place to do it, only then do we put it in our data center. Right? And yet we still did build out a new data center just in the last couple of years, a highly efficient, um, award-winning data center up in Oregon, because there was still enough things that went through that trap, right? Enough things that were core to our business, our core IP, um, that we considered so valuable to the business that we were gonna continue to host on, on site. But there's really a mix of all three of those things. So the funny part may be, and I'll say this candidly, right? NetApp may be storing data not on NetApp systems, right? At the end of the day, it matters what's the best thing for the business when we put it up on a hyperscaler, right? When we put it up on a cloud. When I talk about some of the things we're developing to work with hyperscalers like AWS or Software or Azure or Google or any of these guys, um, we're doing a lot of that development 
for our cloud services in the cloud, right? Once again, eating our own dog food. So for us, even internally, it's about choice. So we absolutely believe that the cloud is gonna be compelling for certain use cases. And a lot of people look at NetApp and they say, well, you're a, I, I see the term legacy being thrown around as though it's a bad word, right? But you're a legacy enterprise storage provider, right? You've been around for 20 years, which in Silicon Valley terms is roughly, what, 100, 140 years, something like that? Is it roughly dog years, something like that? Um, and they say, so you, you, know, you clearly have no, no play in this new cloud world, right? What we believe is that cloud is gonna be compelling, but I think everyone has now kind of settled on the fact that that hybrid cloud is gonna be the dominant model, right? That there's going to be mixtures. There's gonna be businesses that have basically 100%, 99% off in the cloud. There's gonna be businesses that may still have 99% on-prem, even going out five, 10 years. But everyone's gonna be in some mix in there, whether it's 30, 70, 70, 30, 60, you know. Something along those lines. Everyone is gonna be in some mix of this hybrid cloud, and it's gonna be a dominant model. What was interesting to me, um, I went to an AWS summit uh, in San Francisco about probably three months ago, six years ago, uh, six months ago, something like that. And you looked around and it was a whole host of new companies and NetApp. And as far as I can tell, and don't, don't entirely hold me to this because this was on a five second scan, there weren't any other of those quote legacy storage companies there because everyone's making this assumption that we're all competitors, right? That NetApp and AWS are competitors, that NetApp and Azure are competitors. And quite frankly, nothing could be further from the truth. We are with everything in the industry today, cooperators. Right, let's, be, let's be candid, right? We compete on certain things, we partner on certain other things, but the fact is the cloud brings so much value to our end customers, right? Brings so much value to our partners that to deny it is to deny a service to the end customer and to deny reality, right? We're not gonna do that, right? There's absolutely things you should be putting on the cloud and taking off of NetApp storage. And we absolutely need to also to provide you ways, both NetApp and all the other vendors out there, to bring stuff back from the cloud, back into on-prem, right? To repatriate data. That's actually gonna be one of the bigger challenges in the next five years as the pendulum swings back and forth, not because either side is bad or good, but just because that's the natural flow of things, is how are people gonna to start to repatriate workloads that initially appeared ideal for the cloud, but upon further review or upon further development appeared to be something you'd like to repatriate back on-prem, right? So how do we participate in all that? So let's do our first polling question here. And so, do you see yourself using the cloud for primarily, and I know it may be a mixture of both, but primarily backup and disaster recovery, primarily production, or honestly really a pretty balanced blend between, between the two? So if you wanna go ahead and use the polling mechanism there to put in your answer, and we'll give it a second. Okay. So, with a sample size of two, it's both. <laughs> Get out your phones, come on, join in. I know everyone has to get back, from, uh, get back from whatever they were doing on the phones from the 40 minute break. I got in at least four phone calls and 15 emails, that was pretty good. I think that's pretty good efficiency on a 40 minute break. Um, so yeah, so hop on, hop on your phones for the following polling questions. So, the reality is, as we talk to customers, I, I, you know, I probably talk to 10, 20 customers a week, and I haven't wanted, ran into one yet that isn't using the cloud for something, right? And in some cases, even the acknowledgement is, I know we're using the cloud, I'm not entirely sure what we're using the cloud for, right? So the shadow IT phenomenon and Dropbox and Box and all those other things, right? But there's definitely a mixture. And we've seen at NetApp, at least, a lot of our customers leading sort of with new apps into the cloud for production and with enterprise apps they're leading in with sort of backup and disaster recovery, right? If you've already got it working on-prem, if it's already stable, if it's already working, maybe you take advantage of cloud economics to, uh, to do backup and disaster recovery. And if it's something that you're building brand new, I mean, uh, a lot of the things being built today are just absolutely cloud native and belong there. So we see hybrid cloud as this fundamental trend for IT, right, where everything's gonna be split and it's not necessarily gonna be, you know, one third, one third, one third, but honestly, as we've seen customers, it's not working out too far away from that. Between cloud service providers, hyperscale cloud providers, and private clouds built either using traditional hypervisor models or some of the stuff Val and other speakers have talked about, um, things like OpenStack, things like Docker and containers, um, you know, bringing a whole new methodology to doing on-prem development as well. So, where does NetApp come into this? And I'm gonna say one thing up front, this isn't gonna be a sales pitch. Um, I, you know, this isn't the place to do sales pitches, and the other thing is, 
I'm gonna mention a couple NetApp products, but they're primarily examples, right? There's a lot of vendors doing great things in this industry. Um, NetApp is trying, and, and I believe has established a leadership position in the data fabric. But what's more important is to kind of look at the ideas of how we can leverage the cloud. It's not a wholesale move to the cloud. It's not a wholesale aversion to the cloud. It's how do we work with all three of these. Data for us is foundational to the cloud. And here's the interesting thing for NetApp is we've been doing data management now for 20 years. Um, you may have heard some of our executives say this. We're a data management company, you know, wrapped up in the steel of a storage company, right? When you look at data on tap and some of the other solutions that NetApp sells, we deliver them on hardware, but it doesn't have to be delivered as hardware. And even today, we're shifting more and more to delivering as software. But so we have this expertise over the last couple of years of delivering data management solutions. And so when we look at the cloud, when we look at hybrid clouds, the most important thing to us is data, right? One thing to keep in mind is compute itself is relatively, is relatively ephemeral, right? Once you give a processor an instruction, once it's processed that instruction correctly, it doesn't care. It has no sense particularly of state about that instruction. Same thing with a switch, right? Once a switch passes a packet, certainly there may be auditing, there may be logging, there may be all of that going on someplace else. But once the switch itself has passed a packet, it's done with it. On the other hand, if you look at data, if you look at storage, regardless of where that storage is, if you give me 4KB of data, and I'm your storage array, I have to hold it until you tell me otherwise, until the end of time necessarily, right? And how many of us have data that apparently has been living since the end of time in their systems? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, we call that the retention period of what retention period, right? My favorite retention period ever, there was a customer who told me their retention period, um, I do some work in, in public sector as well as otherwise, their retention period was life of the republic. And that was a new one. I'm used to hearing forever, I'm used to hearing like life of the patient plus seven years or some specific, you know, based upon PCI or, or HIPAA or something like that. Life of the Republic was my favorite. So I have a standing request into that customer to give me a heads up. You know, like if they ever say, oh, we need to only order storage for the next two years, then I know to start hoarding gold under my mattress or something, right? Because <laughs> um, they may know something that I don't. So that data, that, that's what matters, right? That's what we have to hold on to. That's what's core. And here's the other nasty thing about data, right, is it has mass, it has gravity, it has inertia, right? It's not easy to move. If you have 10 terabytes of data, if you have 100 terabytes of data, I don't care what pipe you have, it takes a deterministic amount of time to transit that pipe, right? If you use NetApp technology, and you dedupe it and you compress it, if you use WAN acceleration technology, it doesn't matter, right? It takes a deterministic amount of time to move up to the cloud. It's something we have to deal with, right? Um, you know, NetApp had our you know, advanced technology group doing, you know, wormhole research in building 13, unfortunately collapsed into a singularity and we still haven't found them. So until we get that technology working, uh, you know, it's something that we're gonna have to deal with, right? You can't just make these split second choices and move 100 terabytes of data up to the cloud and then move it back the next day. It just doesn't work that way. And even if it did work that way, I think the, uh, the toll road charges on the way there and back would be quite significant. Yeah, we, yeah the, the quantum entanglement group has been working on it, but they'll never either tell us how far along they're going or where they're going. They'll only tell us one or the other, but we can't get them to commit to both. It's very strange. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really weird, and they do strange things with cats. Uh, you know, you can never tell. It's, you know, is it alive? Is it dead? Will you let me open the damn box? Can't find out. So, yeah, the quantum entanglement group is a pain to work with. Um, so... You know, data, it has mass, right? It's at the center of everything, right? Whether it's protection, availability, access, security, performance, governance, all of these things, you know, I feel like I'm in A Few Good Men, right? These are words we all live by. You need me on that wall, right? No, but these are all words we have to live by every day. And regardless of where it's at, right? The cloud service providers and the hyperscale providers and the private cloud, right? We don't get to abrogate our responsibility to that data just because it's been moved someplace else. So when we look at what NetApp is doing and what we're focused on with Data Fabric, it's not necessarily about, ooh, how do we get shiny toys in every piece of this? It's about how do we enable service levels? How do we enable controls? How do we enable all of this so that you can take advantage of wherever the right place is to put that data, get it there efficiently, and not lose control of it in the process, right? That's our mission at NetApp over the next five years. So good point to take a polling question, and if you've got your phones all ready for it. Roughly, if you know, what percent of your data would say is in the cloud today? I'll give you all a moment to do that. Okay. Changing around. Well, first of all, thank you all for getting out your phones. I appreciate that. That's pretty cool. What is that, 23, 28, 31? Yeah, that's pretty cool. 
So I'm happy to announce from the last polling question, we've had a 4,000% improvement. So the, <laughs> I don't know if that math is right. I'm not that good at math, so, but it sounds right. So um, can you put the results back up real quick? Is that possible for you to do back there, or is that unobtainium? So I mean, what this tells us is, is kind of what we're hearing, right? Everyone has dipped a toe into the water. Um, you know, some people have got the whole leg in, right? Um, and then there's three of these brave souls out of the you know, 35 plus of you or so who have committed the majority of your data out to the cloud, which is awesome, right? And this is the sort of distribution we're seeing. And I honestly see this distribution normalizing over time, right? It's never gonna, you know, if, and, and we would actually, if we did this a year from now, I'd argue we'd have to break this category out a little bit more because the gradations would matter more over time. And eventually we'll get to a normal distribution. I wouldn't be surprised if it's around the 50 or 60 or even 70% mark, right? Okay, we can go ahead and move on. So, so I mentioned this, right? This is the challenge. We have all this data, we have all the controls, and yet every single cloud today is sort of an isolated, incompatible data silo, right? And that's not to say there's not plenty of work being done, and there's not to say there aren't standards out there. Um, you know, when we look at object standards, um, there's incredible work being done on Swift, right? There's work that's been done on CDMI. We can all kind of acknowledge that S3 has become the 800-pound gorilla in terms of protocols there. So there are protocols that can work between multiple different um, vendors, but the problem is none of them all speak it the same way, right? None of them have that entire commonality. And you have a diagram up here that makes it look like there's three options, when in reality, you know, if you talk about cloud service providers that, that work with NetApp, there's hundreds, right, 400 plus. If you talk about hyperscale cloud providers, depending upon how you do de your definitions, there's anywhere from, you know, five to 15 with many more making a claim to it as well, right? So you're not just talking about three different potential places with incompatible standards, you're talking about orders of magnitude more. So NetApp's goal with the data fabric is to try and bring all this together, right? We look at a data fabric as not one protocol, right? Not one ring to rule them all, not, you know, we're gonna control all the clouds and everything like that, right? It's not that sort of thing. But it's how can we map all of these standards together? How can we develop a common sort of lingua franca um, or babblefish for other people in this crowd, right? How can we develop a common way of having all of these things work together for the customer? So another quick polling question. Do you use one of the hyperscalers for cloud today? And I'll let you actually do your own definition of that. The obvious ones would be like, as I mentioned, a Google or an AWS or an Azure or software, but there's plenty more um, along that list. I like these polling questions. They're like hydration breaks for me. That's cool. <laughs> Okay, so actually a really good mix between yes and no right now, which is kind of what we'd, kind of what we'd expect, right? We're seeing a significant amount of interest between um, folks who are interested in using these hyperscales. Um, it, what, what does actually surprise me about those results is not nearly as many people at the considering it stage, right? It's like we've either leapt into the pool or we're, we're safely ensconced several feet away from it, right? Um, I would argue as we go out, what I've actually seen is um, a lot more people actually in that C category. So I'd like to congratulate this audience on being, if nothing else, more decisive than the general population. So that's good to, that's good to see. Um, and we wanna support all three of those different types of users. So, there we go. One more polling question. If you do, if you are one of those folks who's using a hyperscaler today, or I'll even put up considering it as well if you're in that, if you're in that boat, um, which providers do you use? And since this, uh, I guess the polling application, it's hard to do multiple choice, so let's say predominantly use between these, uh, these options up here. And there you have it. Is anyone particularly surprised? Um, oh, oh, Azure's making a comeback. Wait, wait, up. Oh, yeah, so, um, and this, this roughly, I mean, Azure is actually making it's interesting making significant inroads in, in customers that we've seen, and it's hard to count Microsoft out with the investment they're making. If you look at just how many billions they're plowing into infrastructure for Azure, it's hard to count them out. Uh, one of the nice things that we're working with is the fact that we fully believe there's gonna be this multi-cloud environment, right? We believe that Amazon um, is absolutely an outstanding partner to work with. We've worked um, very closely with them, um, but as well with Azure, Software, and all these other, uh, other folks to enable choice. Wow, they, we, we put all of these in the center. So, if we take the previous two questions and kind of extrapolate forward, and you think in five years from now, so let's go out to 2020, when we'll all have hoverboards and flying cars. Um, actually, I think we got hoverboards this year, right? 
they're not really good. They only work if you're like actually hoverboarding over a uh, superconducted you know, surface, I, you know, cooled at subdegree temperatures, but everyone has one of those in their basement, right? So, um, okay. So, and, and what we're seeing here is at least, you know, the predominant, you know, 17 out of the folks responding here, at least are gonna be over the 25% mark. Um, the folks that were already over 50 to 100% mark are clearly continuing to see that move along, right? Um, what's interesting to me is no one has been brave enough to say A. Um, so everyone is acknowledging um, that, that a good percentage of their data is going to be out in the cloud by, by 2020. So what NetApp has really been doing, and if you're interested in, in what NetApp's strategy is and what our thoughts are with this data fabric, what we've been doing from a product strategy has really been a journey. So from around 2004 to 2009, roughly, we were busy virtualizing storage, right? We were known for, um, you know, two decades ago, building the first network attached storage. And then we were trying to go ahead and, with things like Data on Tap 7, um, virtualize it further, add unified SAN with NAS, add storage efficiency features, all of that good stuff that we've been known for for a couple decades. From 2010 to 2014, we were on this journey to then go ahead and virtualize whole storage systems. And without going into a, a tremendous amount of detail on it, because I'll touch on it, with what we've done with something called cluster data on tap is this concept of taking individual storage systems and really containerizing them and building storage virtual machines on top of them. So we were attempting to virtualize that. And by the way, each one of these, I'm not a huge fan of having an end date on these because the journey doesn't ever end, right? But this is where the sort of predominant focus has been. And from last year on, our focus has now been how can we virtualize clouds, plural, right? That doesn't mean homogenize the cloud. It doesn't mean force you towards one cloud. It doesn't mean force you onto a NetApp cloud. In fact, we don't have a NetApp cloud because we don't think there's a reason, right? We think that there's plenty. How many, how many people think there's plenty of clouds out there to choose from already, right? I mean, we could always use more, I suppose, but uh, what we would rather do is help you virtualize that, right? Help build common data standards so that people who are using NetApp hardware or using NetApp software can take advantage of multiple different clouds without having to rewrite operating procedures and rewrite processes with each new cloud. So our technology architecture for the data, data fabric, when you get down a little bit more to, to actual individual products, is all based upon, um, I don't know if this is the laser pointer, yeah, is all based upon um, this thing called cluster data on tap, SnapMirror and SnapVault, which are replication technologies, and on command, which are orchestration and management portfolio, right? That's at the core for us of, of how we enable the data fabric for our customers. On top of that, there's still a bunch of hardware, right? And one of the interesting trends in the, in the storage industry right now is this move or this examination of, do I buy hardware? Do I buy converged systems? Do I buy hyper-converged systems? Do I buy software-only storage? And you may assume that I'm gonna have a strong opinion on that. My strong opinion on that is whatever makes sense, right? At NetApp, we're a company that's been in the business of selling boxes full of hard drives for 20 years. And we're gonna keep doing that, as long as that makes sense, and as long as people want engineered systems, but that doesn't mean we're gonna do it exclusively, right? What matters to us is the software. These are platforms on which to run the software. As I mentioned, working with you know, 400 plus different cloud service providers, and then over just the last year, we've introduced multiple different technologies, from something called NetApp Private Storage for Cloud that I'll talk about, actually running our premier operating system directly within AWS, that's something called Cloud ONTAP, and introducing what's basically a cloud translation layer um, in the form of a, a cloud-enabled backup appliance, an archive appliance called AltaVault. So I'll walk you through each one of those just to give you a sense for how we're starting to approach the problem. Again, my goal is not to come here and say, come buy our stuff, right? That's not the point. What I'm trying to show you is I think where the industry is going in terms of actually instantiating a lot of the vision that we've talked about in terms of actual deployable things that you could go back in the next week and deploy from us or you know, from our competitors or from our partners, right? Um, I think everyone has a role to play in building this fabric. So, there we go. So with cluster data on tap, how many of you are from, by the way, how many of you are, are familiar with cluster data on tap or have heard the term before? Okay, good. How many of you are NetApp employees who were raising your hand? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> how many of you were NetApp employees that didn't raise your hand? That's a better question. Please report to the back. No. So, when we built cluster data on tap, Here's the interesting thing we did. We went out and we said, you can scale up to four million, five million IOPS, you can build a 50 petabyte cluster, you can do all these cool things, which is cool if you want a 50 petabyte cluster, or you need four million IOPS. If you do, once again, there are people in the back, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but what's more important, what I think got lost in all of that, 
the most important thing we did is we've essentially containerized our storage operating system. Built into cluster data on tap is this concept of storage virtual machines, right? So we took um, what essentially originally the, the analogy was what VMware did for hypervisors and basically did on the storage layer, but it's actually as containers have risen over the last year or two, and I'll be very clear, we didn't use you know, Docker-style containerization technology to do this because it didn't exist when we built this, right? But as we look at it, we're not instantiating you know, the same OS in every single one of these. The OS is common right, under here, and we're just instantiating the network layer, um, the exports, the data, the metadata into these indiv individualized containers and making them portable. So the goal from there is you can move those containers and you can instantiate those containers across multiple different heterogeneous brands of NetApp hardware and third-party hardware and now out into the cloud. And it doesn't take you know, too much looking forward to think that those containers are gonna be the way we make data far more portable and transportable going forward. Um, in fact, one of the things we did in one of the most release, um, recent releases of software is make it so you can use one of those SVMs as the basis for DR, essentially, and do DR on a far more um, granular basis, you know, bringing up and down and mirroring individual storage virtual machines instead of a whole system. So for us, Data on Tap is the software that enables our journey, all the way from, yes, there are still gonna be people building data centers, and they may be end users, they may be cloud service providers, they may be partners, but there's still gonna be places for engineered data systems. There's gonna be places for third party, there's gonna be places for something, Data on Tap Edge runs as software directly on a commoditized box, typically seen in the remote office, but just about anywhere. There's gonna be places where you wanna run right near the cloud, and this is NetApp private storage, and then there's gonna be times you wanna run right on the cloud. Okay, so this is the journey that NetApp is committed to, and this, quite frankly, is a journey that we see the industry having to commit to, right, is the answer is not, you know, pick one. The answer is you're probably gonna use three out of these five. You may use all five out of these five based upon where it makes the most sense to have your data, where it makes the most sense to have your compute, right? This is not a one-size-fits-all sort of scenario. So when we look at all, all on-prem, right, that's where we look at things like all flash, right? And with the all flash systems we, we have today, we can scale out using the exact same storage operating system that you're able to run in the cloud, and you're able to run things like those four million IAPs. You're able to run five petabytes of all flash capacity. You're able to run clusters that mix spinning hard drives with all flash, right? This is something that actually is really new to NetApp over the last six months or so. So if you haven't looked at this, I would encourage um, you know, the fundamental dynamics of Flash have just changed so significantly over the last two years, and the economics of Flash have changed so significantly um, that we're actually seeing most customers, if they have any sort of performance requirement whatsoever, they're starting to move towards these, these all Flash configurations. So um, being able to do this is basically our on-prem private cloud offering has been key to, to enabling that data fabric from a performance aspect in the private cloud. This, by the way, is we, we do encourage transparency and benchmarks. NetApp has been one of the guys leading on benchmarks. I would encourage, as you do that, I, I don't like those things where we throw out, you know, I just did it, but we throw out four million IOPS and don't actually define what we mean by an IOP, right? So these sort of independent third-party benchmarks like the SPC1 benchmark I think are incredibly important as you're evaluating um, on-prem all-flash options. This is an example of what we delivered um, about three or four months ago. And then what we're building into each one of our products, some of it today and some of it tomorrow, is this ability to move things from on-prem, all flash, move data directly into hybrid disk-based situations, then move it directly out into the cloud, whether through a backup gateway or directly onto the same version of storage operating system running out in the cloud itself. Right? To us, once again, this is critical that the data not be siloed at any one place whether it's on-prem, off-prem, hybrid cloud, um, or any one type of controller even, right? It needs to be able to move from place to place to place. Things are moving too rapidly in this world to get locked into um, a, a single sort of deployment modality. So that lets us do this sort of orchestration, right? We do not believe this is gonna be a one cloud, you know, fits all world. We don't believe this is gonna be a one orchestration cloud world, right? No one thing is gonna take control of everything, right? I don't purposely, I, I don't actually believe it's even gonna get to the point where we have with hypervisors where it's not like we have just one hypervisor, but VMware has certainly taken a lion's share, right? I think it's gonna be a far more sort of heterogeneous mix of things out there. So between different orchestration engines, between different um, clouds out there, and between different ways of, of deploying things, that's really where our vision is of, 
moving these storage virtual machines around. So Cloud ONTAP I mentioned. Um, Cloud ONTAP for us is interesting. It's the concept of you don't need to give up control of your data, you don't need to give up governance of your data, you don't need to give up the skill sets you already have. Um, we've heard from some great speakers this morning talking about um, how in some cases skill sets are gonna be obsoleted over time and it's a tough conversation. And he's absolutely right. Some skill sets are gonna be obsoleted over time. I'm kind of guessing mine's gonna be one of them, so I've been working on like shorthand cook, fry cook, I don't, but, um, but they don't necessarily have to be obsolete and not all at once, right? So if we've got people who have skills, um, say in storage administration, say they're a NetApp administra administrator, say they're, they're familiar with that, we can bring that into the cloud, right? So we instantiated Cloud ONTAP about a year ago so that you can take advantage of everything we delivered for the past 20 years, but you can actually swipe a credit card. One of the huge changes for us as a company, you talk about having to, to adopt to new agile challenges is we're used to a sales cycle where we come in, talk to you about our gear, you know, go through a competitive cycle. Um, if you do choose to, to use our business, there's a purchase order, we ship gear, we set it up. The new world of the cloud is waking up at 3 a.m., deciding you have an idea and wanting to start on it then, right? So changing our business model so that someone could swipe a credit card on the AWS marketplace and instantiate a version of ONTAP within five or 10 minutes was a huge change for us, um, but we've done it. And that's the way I think that all quote, legacy vendors are gonna to need to do is adopt to these new consumption models, right? It's just, it's a fundamental change. It's, it's, it's very clearly adapt or die, right? If people don't change, if people, these existing legacy vendors, if we don't start to deliver services to every user from the person who's been doing it for 50 years and, and wants to stick with traditional infrastructure to the kid who just dropped out of college, has only hoodies in his closet and wants to sit at home and swipe something and have an infrastructure up, we have to have a breadth of offerings that, that appeal to every one of those sort of users. So I'm gonna skip through this for purposes of time. Let me see where we are. We're good. So a couple, couple interesting usage examples as people think about where they want to adopt cloud. Um, building, for example, secondary DR site in AWS. One of the first places that we've seen people um, achieve substantial savings is instead of standing up a second data center or building out a whole second environment sitting there either cold or warm, to do not much, right? Standing up a Cloud ONTAP instance takes a couple minutes, you replicate your data out there, and you pay minimal charges while that's running, and you only instantiate all of the VMs and all the applications and all the network infrastructure and all the compute that you need in the event of an actual disaster, right? I think it's been a kind of a truism. No one ever wants to pay for DR until the disaster happens, at which point like the checkbook opens faster than you know, we can actually observe it opening. So this actually maps far better to how we want to spend money on disasters, right? We want to spend the bare minimum on a notional disaster that is highly unlikely to happen so because that money delivers absolutely no benefit to the business except in the advent of that disaster. This is far more like an insurance model, right? Where we pay for insurance on our homes and we pay for um, insurance on our cars on the assumption that nothing's ever gonna happen, but if something catastrophic does happen, you need it to be there, right? So paying the minimal amount to replicate data out, to have a single software instance sitting in the cloud, um, holding all your data, but with the realization that if something really bad does happen, you can spin up an AWS very rapidly, have hundreds or thousands of compute nodes sitting there humming along, dealing with your disaster until you can repatriate on-prem. Another example um, that people are taking to heart is the sort of concept of test and dev. And the great thing is this is not an either or. Once people had this data out in the cloud, once some of our customers put this data out in the cloud, they said, okay, well that data's sitting there, what more can I do with it? So with Cloud ONTAP, with some of the tools we've had in there for 10, 15 years, they're able to build off hundreds or thousands of clones and spin up development instances in minutes to go ahead and do development on them, keep them around for days or shut them down every night and build, you know, reiterate, shut down, start up, build, reiterate over and over again without taking up any additional space and without having to constantly move data around and without having to have a set amount of compute cycles in a separate test and dev environment on premise, sitting there sucking up heat, power, cooling, and dollars for development efforts that may be far too irregular to predict um, on an on-prem infrastructure, right? This is about matching the curve of demand exactly to the curve of available resources. That's what the cloud is great at, right? This also means though you don't need to translate, right? You don't need to put your data into a different format than you have it in production. You don't need to do anything but replicate it out there. And straight off that DR copy, you can go ahead and build clones straight on top of it and do whatever development you want. This is something that a, a number of, of our customers have, have started to do. 
The other solution I mentioned, NetApp Private Storage, and this is actually the one that, that excites me the most and the one that honestly we've had the most customers looking at. It's this concept of using that on-demand compute, using the massive scalability, using the pay-as-you-go model, combining it with using multiple clouds simultaneously and still maintaining control of your data, data governance, performance, and availability. So this is that near the cloud option. And I don't hear nearly as many people talking about near the cloud. We assume cloud is this, is this sort of binary state, right? You're either in the cloud or you're out of the cloud, unless we're going back to the quantum entanglement discussion, right? Um, the truth is people are gonna live in both worlds and there's not actually a reason today why you can't have your data sitting near the cloud and have your compute and your networking happening in the cloud. So what we actually do in this particular example, let me see if I have this one right in here, is we work with partners like say Equinix, right? And have systems set up in Equinix where you're sitting next to the cloud. Okay, so it looks a lot like on the storage side like a traditional colo model. It's, it's a true hybrid model. It looks like a traditional sort of colo model where you're paying, paying power and pipe, you have a cage. The, the best question to always ask, how do, you know, how do you know who has control of your data, right? If, you, if there's one question to ask, what's that question? Anyone? Who has the root password is the correct answer, right? Whoever has the root password or the administrative password technically controls your data, and hopefully they're in the same country that you are. Um, so you still have control of your data. You still have control of your storage. The, the, the other answer to that question, by the way, is you know, who does the subpoena go to if they need to get access to data, right? So you still control your system. You still control your data. But you have these dedicated links, and all of these guys have points of presence directly in these same data centers. They're literally in the same building or across an alleyway away, so you're getting land speed latencies connecting to them. So we've always thought of, of latency to the cloud as one of the biggest challenges to the cloud, and it is, but if you've actually, instead of trying to move the cloud to you, you've moved your data to the cloud, then you can actually have your data sitting near the cloud, outside of it, still in your control, but you can have these multiple clouds that all have access to it. So you can take advantage of compute, right? You can take advantage of scalability. You can switch between clouds without it being this exercise in uh, you know, massive movement of data back out and massive movement of data back in. Um, we demonstrated a year ago, it was pretty cool, actually failing a SQL server over in eight seconds with it not going down between AWS and Azure. All right, so you're actually able to protect against the failure of an entire cloud, the failure of entire availability regions. Um, you're able to technically go ahead and bid out. You could, you could in the morning say, I want 1,000 instances on Amazon, and in the afternoon say, I want 1,000 instances on Azure. I don't think we're entirely there yet, but if we get there with automation um, and, and the scale of automation we're gonna need to with containers, it's entirely conceivable. And by the way, the on-premise is actually optional, but you can add on-premise storage and have it replicate and keep some things on-premise, some things near the cloud, and other things in the cloud, right? Once again, if any message you could take out of this about the data fabric is the data fabric is about one size not necessarily fitting all, and that the cloud is not an if-then or an if or choice, it's really an and choice, right? You can leverage all of these different options as you're thinking about your architectures. Okay. So it really does, when we talk about converged infrastructure, we're used to talking about converged infrastructure in the sense of things like um, NetApp's FlexPod, or VCE's vBlock, right? Or some of the new hyper-converged infrastructures, right? And all of those are true on-prem converged infrastructures, but I would offer up there's a whole new sort of model of converged infrastructures, and that's cloud converged infrastructures, right? Can we build infrastructures now that leverage the best of the best on-prem and keep your data where you want it to be, but leverage the best of the best on the cloud, right? Combine the absolute scalability of the compute and networking. No one's gonna be able to stand up 10,000 cores in a couple minutes in their on-prem data center, right? But these guys can. So combine their scalability with sort of the resiliency and ability to control your data of being near the cloud, and you have a whole new sort of cloud converged infrastructure model, something I would offer up to you. AltaVault for us is this concept of building then a translation layer between all of them, right? So that you have multiple different backup vendors. Once again, we believe this is gonna be a heterogeneous world. Multiple different public clouds and multiple different private clouds. It could be from NetApp, it could be from a competitor, it could be from another competitor. We don't care. And we don't believe that, once again, it's gonna be a one-size-fits-all world, right? So AltaVault for us today is about how do we take backups and how do we take archive and move them efficiently out to clouds because backup and recovery is one of the, the chief use cases today for the cloud. 
But moving forward in the future, it's about much more. It's about our translation layer, right? It's about how do we check between all of these different incompatible standards but make them all talk to each other. So that's just kind of a little preview of, of what we're gonna be doing um, there. And by the way, you know, I mentioned that NetApp is shifting rapidly to being a, a software company in a lot of ways. Uh, when we released AltaVault, um, and it was, it was an acquisition, so I should be clear on that, but when we took it and we re-released it as AltaVault, right out the door on day one, we released it as a physical appliance, we, re we uh, released it as a virtual appliance, and we released it as a cloud resident appliance. Once again, this is about at 2 a.m. in the morning, if someone decides they want capabilities, we need to be able to let them have that physically on-prem, we need to be able to let them deploy it as a VM on multiple different hypervisors, or we need to be able to let them log into a cloud, swipe a credit card, and stand up an instance, right? That's the new method by which, frankly, all um, enterprise providers are gonna need to adopt to doing business, right? We're gonna need to provide our services in multiple different formats. Because at the end of the day, it's about mapping to this curve. Right, it's about how do we go from sort of this, where self-hosting traditional IT, you know, you make your absolute best guess about predicted demand, and for the first half of that life cycle, you've got this waste, because demand is still ramping up. You've got this like nirvana, which lasts all of, I think 15 minutes, where demand meets supply, right? Is 15 minutes about right? Yeah. So, um, and then immediately, demand exceeds what was predicted, and you've got customer dissatisfaction, right? This is, this is sort of the Pandora's box and the pain that we've all had with traditional rigid on-prem IT. And there's a million models we've looked at between on-demand and, and all sorts of other ways we can get around it. Um, but the simple fact is, this works if you've got predictable demand and you wanna have consistency and your data needs to be on-prem. But no one can deny the ability of cloud and cloud compute to go ahead and map far more, uh, far more easily and far more agilely to the actual demand and minimize waste. So for us at NetApp, the point is, you know, don't, don't deny the cloud, right? Don't run around and say, no, 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 it's not going to the cloud, I'm not looking over there, right? That's not a value to our customers, right? We need to deliver on what all of you need to be doing, which is figuring out which data stays on-prem, which data goes to cloud service providers, which data goes out into the cloud, and regardless of it, offering you support across all of those spectrum. So, a couple quick examples, and then I'll uh, shift to questions. Um, this is a good one. One of our first NetApp private storage customers um, built a whole Red Hat Cloud Forms uh, management stack for Typhoon simulation, basically. They're able to take the data they have on-prem, mirror it directly into this Direct Connect data center, hook it up to AWS, and be able to stand up significant amount of compute there to be able to do cloud bursting whenever they need to do actual um, Typhoon simulation and other high-performance workloads, right? So um, they actually won a Red Hat Innovation Award for that. Another one, um, major uh, mid-sized manufacturing company, disaster recovery for SAP, right? They still run it on an on-prem data center. They haven't moved everything over to like an SAP um, cloud instance, right, because they still want to have it in-house. But they replicate over, direct connect up into AWS, and they're able to run their SAP instances for disaster recovery directly within AWS. So if they have some sort of issue, either uh, internal or they have you know, a data center that burns down or they just have some sort of problem with the application stack, they're able to not stop, shut down the production. They're able to move things over here and continue manufacturing. Another quick example. Oh, sorry, forgot to put up there. So about 90% savings, zero physical DR servers. This is the cool part, is they don't have a single compute server anywhere over here. They only bring this up when they actually need DR. Um, don't need to buy a hypervisor license over here. And they're now using 75% less data center space. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is a financial company that actually went all cloud. So they have their Direct Connect data centers that are hosted. So these are still hosted in their control. They have a NetApp system here, a NetApp system here, and they're on two different AWS instances that they use to balance across, right? So we've seen the two data center on-prem model. We've seen the data center and cloud model. This is actually skipping ahead to the cloud and cloud model, right? And there's no reason, by the way, that over time this has to be AWS and AWS. This could be AWS and SoftLayer or SoftLayer and Azure, right? This is probably the future of a large percentage of our IT where people are not necessarily pushing everything into the cloud, they're still maintaining control of it, and they may even go on multiple different clouds, but they're not building on-prem nearly as much. So they save 70% of their server cost to move 90% of their VMs straight over to EC2, and their goal is to eventually move about 10,000 VMs into this model. Finally, a consolidation example. So there's a multinational um, firm that has a, has a habit of doing M&A, right? So each time they bring in a new data center, they pump this data into a direct connected data center 
push this in, push this in. They built one new on-premise DC. And the interesting thing is instead of mirroring all this over to the on-prem DC like you would normally in an M&A environment, they actually mirror the stuff directly up into the cloud, into this direct connect data center, use EC2 for whatever they can, right, for both permanent and transient workloads. And then they actually built a new on-prem data center where they repatriated data over time that they found was not just an artifact of the transition, not just an artifact of the M&A, but was actually gonna be core data moving forward. They built a brand new data center repatriated from there. So we're seeing all sorts of new dynamics, all sorts of new ways in which we can shift things around to really make it make sense for the business. So a data fabric, uh, hopefully what I've left for you is it's not a product from NetApp, right? You're not gonna run to the back and say, I'd like to buy one data fabric, please, all right? I think that would be a dramatic oversimplification of, of the work we all have to do. But it's this concept of dealing with these incompatible data silos, right? All of these things that really are literal sort of Tower of Babel stuff where we're not even speaking the same language and trying to overlay it a uh, structure that lets you pick where your data needs to belong, lets you retain governance, lets you utilize the cloud for what it's great at, right? But still maintain control. So you have that freedom, you have that mobility, you have that speed, but you still have the governance and you can still realize the whole full potential of hybrid cloud. On that note, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm uh, ready to take some questions. Jeff Baxter, everybody. Yes. All right. We got one right here in the back center. Bum, bum, bum. Hi, uh, this is uh, Nabil Zaki with Utility Trailer. Uh, we've been NetApp users for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. We have our own NAS. Thank you. And our main application is for, uh, we design our own product using 3D CAD modeling. It's intensive graphics and bigger mm -hmm. files. Yeah. And you mentioned cloud and tab is good for uh, DR and development and test. Yeah. Uh, how about for interactive user? People that have to download the file, work on it, and upload it. Is this, I have two issues, performance and security. Yeah. How you guys can? It's a great question. So cloud on tab today, I think the reason we position it in the test and dev is because it's a natural fit for some of the workloads. There's absolutely no reason that you can't have users hitting it directly. It's a full instantiated version of ONTAP. You have all the protocols, you have all the features. The performance of it, though, is, is more equivalent to, if you're familiar with NetApp, more equivalent to sort of like our entry line systems or something like that, right? So uh, the answer is always it depends, and I hate that answer from a vendor, right? But it depends upon exactly how much performance you're putting against it. If you're expecting it to be the equivalent of, you know, 100,000 IOP on-prem all-flash array, absolutely not. If you're expecting, you know, tens of thousands of IOPS and, and a robust set of users hitting it, absolutely it's something that could work for you. And our goal over time, by the way, is to continue to improve the performance on that because our goal is that there should eventually be absolutely no performance differentiation at all, right? So that's, that's the direction of cloud on tap. The, the one we're shipping today after the first, you know, nine months of being out in the market is more in the like 10,000 of IOPS, you know, sort of um, production use against it, right? And the interesting thing there is um, that there's nothing saying you can't pop up you know, 10, 15, 20, 100 different uses of cloud on tap, right? It's, it's the cloud, so if, if it's something that's easily divisible and easily parallel, um, you can, you know, do parallel I.O. against it, it's something you could stand up multiple instances of very easily as well. You know, it seems like the theme from today from all the speakers is moving to a hybrid cloud approach, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. as you go out and speak to CIOs and CTOs, what are the biggest challenges they share with you in terms of taking that approach to yeah. the next level? Because a lot of the data that came up today was a lot of companies are still not in the cloud. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple, I mean, I think we can all probably name them. I mean, the, the security is number one, right? I think for a lot of people, we hear that time and time again. And it's not, by the way, a fundamental belief that the cloud is insecure, it's a fundamental uncertainty. In fact, I would think the wrapper around cloud inhibitors is, is basically uncertainty, right? Uncertainty around security, uncertainty around cost, uncertainty around how I'm gonna manage it, uncertainty about how much it's gonna cost if I need to pull back from it, right? So a, a large part of what we're doing um, in the future with NetApp is trying to answer a lot of those uncertainty questions, right? I don't like to be one of those people who comes up and says we've solved it, right, because it's a journey. Um, but we know that if we can help assure people around security, in fact, that's one of the primary reasons we did NetApp private storage is it's gonna take time for people to trust the security of the hyperscalers, right? Um, so if they can take steps towards it, right, apply the exact same security controls that they currently have, then they can at least start to get around that one and start to make some momentum towards it. There's kind of a chicken and the egg problem where if you haven't stepped into the cloud, it just becomes like a project 
to, to validate it, and then you never get there, and, and you just keep going in circles. So it's kind of like you have to take that first, first step into the pool. Um, and, and then on top of that, we're doing a heck of a lot of work now on trying to model workloads and model, model costs. One of the things we have is a cloud manager that I kind of skipped by in the interest of time um, that can help you actually model what your costs will be going to the cloud for the actual workloads that you're running and give you that feedback and give you visibility into that. On Command Cloud Manager, it's a prod, uh, product from NetApp. So that's the other thing that we're, we're trying to work on to be able to do that for customers. So um, we're currently vCloud Air customers. Are okay. you guys going to do an, do you have an NPS offering in vCloud Air? Um, not, not one today and not one that I could announce. I know it's certainly something that, that we're interested in. Uh, and one other question. Uh, there's sort of been this move, uh, it seems a lot of people, uh, VMworld, a lot of people looking at all flash arrays and so forth. Um, I still have, you know, great hesitancy about this. I don't know if everybody saw the article, uh, Google data center in Belgium struck by lightning and a small <laughs> percentage of customers lost data permanently. Yeah. So I think that the, the interesting idea with uh, the cloud grid stuff is, you know, look, Maybe we'll go with all flash, but I would only go with it if I had it in at least two physical locations. So the ability to essentially have cloud to cloud replication yeah. and that kind of stuff makes starts to make that look interesting. Yeah, I'm 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 desperately hoping the cloud will turn out to be and this sounds weird because it sounds more challenging, but I'm desperately hoping the cloud will turn out to be more heterogeneous than homogeneous, right? Um, specifically for that reason. Um, what we've seen with the hyperscalers um, is that they have dramatically good availability except for those small periods of time when they don't, right? And that sounds like a dumb thing to say, but if you look at their availability, and it is a dumb thing to say, I specialize in that, right? Um, but if you look at their availability and they talk about four nines or even five nines, the interesting thing is they're really more like 100% available a tremendous amount of the time, but then they have that really nasty rolling outage for two to four hours where availability zone after availability zone blow up because someone shanked the global load balancer or something, right? So from my perspective, when I'm looking at the hyperscaler and putting all my chips on that, on that one table, that's one of the reasons we did NetApp Private Storage and some of the other stuff is to be able to abrogate across multiple different distinct architectures, right? The chances of an Azure and an AWS zone going down simultaneously are one of those sort of black swan events. It could happen. Anything can happen. If you've been in IT long enough, I had a sewage line break directly above my sand and nowhere else, right? So I have that. I still can smell it. Um, you know, 20 years later, I can still, you know. So, I mean, that, that we all have those black swan events, but if we can architect around it and actually architect to disparate heterogeneous clouds, which is, you know, kind of what we're working on, we reduce the, the ability of doing that. And then um, putting things on all flash, um, I mean, the industry's moving to all flash just because the economics are making so much ridiculous sense now, right? The days of disk drives for performance are incredibly numbered, right? Um, and, and we've seen actually better mean time between failure and flash. Whether there's some new failure modes that we haven't run into yet because true enterprise use of Flash is not even really a decade old, I don't know. But that's another good reason, like you're saying, to mirror something out to the cloud or go otherwise. I, I doubt it, quite honestly. It's been incredibly resilient for us and, and other companies, but um, I can understand the hesitation moving to new models, absolutely. Is there one last one? If not, big hand Thank for you. Jeff Baxter, everybody. Thank you.